Hello, and welcome for joining the Shelterbox Syria Briefing. Thank you for joining us as we reflect on 10 years of war in Syria. This month, March 2021, marks 10 years since a peaceful protest broke out in Syria. It's led now to 10 years of war and one of the worst humanitarian crisis situations in the world today. Today for our panel, we have assembled a very diverse group of activists, of humanitarians, many who've become friends, and they're gonna be sharing some personal perspective as it relates to the war in Syria. My name is Carrie Murray, and it is a privilege to serve as president of Shelterbox USA. I'm gonna be your moderator for today, and I am hoping that this will be an interactive session. So please feel free to chat in questions throughout. And at the end of today's webinar, we will get to some Q&A questions. So to start off, and before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the work of Shelterbox. If you know about Shelterbox, you probably know us as being a frontline humanitarian aid organization. We work on the front lines of crisis situations. We respond to some of the world's biggest disaster situations. Mainly, you probably know us for our work in disaster relief as it relates to earthquakes, fires, floods, tsunamis, some of the world's biggest disasters. But really, the ever-growing piece of our work and one of the fastest growing pieces of our work over the past decade has been our work responding to conflict situations in some of the world's biggest and most extreme conflict zones, and that includes in Syria. So to share with you a little bit more about what we do, we really focus on the provision of emergency shelter and basic supplies when families have lost everything in disaster and conflict situations. We have an iconic green box that's behind me, and inside that box, are really the fundamental building blocks in the recovery process when a family has lost their home in a disaster in a, or in a conflict situation. Oftentimes, the center of gravity is the shelter. It's the tent, it's tarpaulins, it's the basic framings to create a home for a family that's been displaced. And then it's essential household items. It's very basic things to help a family recover and get back on their feet again. Things like cooking equipment, solar lanterns when you've lost power, water purification when you've had contamination of the water source, very basic things like blankets, often children's clothing, and now with COVID-19, things like hygiene items, personal protection devices, sanitizers, gloves, masks. But we, what we know is whether it's a disaster, whether it's a conflict situation, or whether it's now a global pandemic, shelter is one of the most profound differences we can make in someone's life. And that is what we've been doing for over two decades at Shelterbox. So I'd like to turn our attention now to the displacement in our world. And believe it or not, there are more people displaced in our world than in any time in recorded history. It's 104 million people that are now displaced. And Syria leads the world in global displacement. We're looking now at 2020 numbers, and as you can see, there's massive waves of displacement across our world, but conflict is actually driving, is the leading driver of displacement. Nearly 70 million people in our world that are displaced are displaced by conflict, and Syria is leading the way. So let's look at Syria. Syria, as you know, sits within the Middle East. It sits um, just above Jordan to the north. It's got Iraq and Iran to the east, to the left and the west, you have Lebanon. And then in that lower southwest corner, you have Israel. So, and to the north, far north, obviously Turkey. But what you can see is it's largely landlocked, just except for that tiny little sliver in the southwest corner that sits on the Mediterranean Sea. This is a country that is one of extremes, especially in terms of the environmental situation. Hot, dry, dusty, arid summers, prone to drought situations, and then winters, extraordinarily cold winters, uh, flood-based situations, which we've recently seen in the region as well. So Syria is a country that is one of the, the oldest countries in the world. It's home to seven world heritage sites. Um, this is actually a mosque in Aleppo. 
And this is one of our World Heritage Sites. On the left, you can see that mosque. Um, this is a pre-war photo, and this to the right is taken just a couple years ago. And that has been, um, obviously, the destruction from the shelling and from the violence within Syria. We've lost one of our World Heritage Sites. So looking at the number of days, this war has dragged on over 10 years. It's 3,666 days. Um, that compares to when World War II came to an end, which was 2,194 days. Uh, in Syria, we've seen half of the pre-war population that's been displaced. And 6.7 million Syrians are displaced internally, their IDPs within Syria. Over five and a half million have been forced to flee to places like Turkey, to Lebanon, to Jordan, to Greece, uh, across Europe, as you know. And we've seen now that about 80% of the Syrians that are living within the country are now at the poverty level. And there are massive waves right now of food insecurity, bread crisis going on. The Syrian pound has lost 70% of its value against the US dollar. And it is just a horrible situation and a struggle for survival every day for Syrians. Now, this is um, a photo that we're all too familiar with at Shelterbox. Um, and what we see is so often in these situations, Syrians are internally displaced many times. I, we've heard upwards of 12 or more times Syrians are on the go looking for a safe place for their families. They often flee with nothing more than the clothes on their back. And at Shelterbox, we remain absolutely committed to helping these families. It's everything from emergency shelter, tents, tarpaulins, jerry cans, solar lanterns, to basic things like you see here, carpets, mattresses, things that people could move with that really help enable their recovery and bring a bit of comfort on their worst days ever. So our work in Syria started in 2012, and during this time, we have helped at over 400,000 Syrians that we've provided emergency shelter and or household supplies. That's over 80,000 families. This work does not make the headlines. It is quiet work, but it is truly life-saving for these families. And it is the reason that in 2018 and in 2019, Shelterbox was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for our work in some of the world's most extreme conflict zones. So here are some photos. I wanna just give you a quick look into what delivering humanitarian aid is like in the country. It's incredibly complex. You're gonna learn about that today. We couldn't do it without the help of many Syrians in the country that risk their lives to distribute this aid for us. But as you can see, and here's a quote from UNOCHA, the scale, the severity, and the complexity across Syria remains absolutely overwhelming and innocent civilians continue to bear the brunt of the conflict. Now, when you look at who's really bearing the brunt of the conflict, it's often children. And more than 50% of the people displaced in Syria today are under the age of 18, they're children. 75% are women and children, and we remain absolutely committed to helping these families that are caught in the conflict. Now, before I introduce our first panelist today, I wanna to share with you a brief story. And this is Mateus. And Mateus is one of the survivors. Uh, he is a refugee and he and his mother were forced to flee Syria. And his mother was heavily pregnant when she left Syria and she fled to save the life of her unborn child. And she made it to, to Lebanon and she had to scale mountains to get there. But this is an area that early in the conflict, Shelterbox was really focused on helping Syrian refugees in many of the countries that they were fleeing to. And Lebanon was one of those places. And, and Mateus, um, like so, so many, is just uh, a very innocent bystander in this conflict. And the first home that he's ever known has been a Shelterbox tent. And we hear that far too often, that for his mom, this was a, a safe landing zone. This was the place that she delivered her baby, and this was the first home for him. And so our work at Shelterbox is truly helping some of the most vulnerable people on the planet, and it continues. So without further ado, 
I would like to interview our first panelist today. Um, he is a dear friend and he is an extraordinary human being, Mr. Sam Cotty. Sam was born in Syria. He is a Syrian born, but he is now an American filmmaker. He makes films, he writes them, he produces them, he directs them. And Sam is gonna share a bit more about his film with us today. But prior to making this, um, Sam had made several films and really acclaimed films like The Citizen. And his most recent film is called Little Gandhi. And it was really the first film that has ever been nominated from Syria for an Academy Award. And it was not easy to make. And it tells the story of one of the very early peace activists within Syria. And I know it took him several years to make this film and we're gonna learn about it. But Sam has also been recognized um, by the prestigious Cinema for Peace for raising awareness of human rights issues through his films. He has been an interviewee for the International Criminal Court in The Hague. He is a TEDx speaker, and he's also a member of the Directors Guild of America. So before we meet Sam, I want to show you a brief trailer from his official entry as Syria's first ever foreign language film for the Academy Awards, Little Gandhi. قلنا سوا بال 2003 وقينا بالسجن سنتين ونص من من 50 شخص 100 شخص يطلعوا مثلا او مثل ما هن يعدموا ميدانيا عندنا ما عنده مشكله يعدموا مليون واحد سوا فدا قائد الوطن اللي هن عم يعذبونا هدول ما لهم بشر والله ما لهم بشر ما فيك توصفهم لانه ما عادت بس قصه انه إنه اعتقال ولا أعطي ولا جرحة ولا شيء حانونا كتير. And I didn't tell Washington what we were doing either because I didn't want Washington to tell me don't do that. شفت أول عشر ثواني من مقطع الفيديو تبع غياس ولا اليوم ما عندي الجرأة إني كملهم بعد عشر ثواني. He was a real tense. Wow. It's my absolute privilege to introduce Sam Cotty. Sam, I have seen Little Gandhi several times and every time, even the trailer, it just gets me. It is so emotionally charged, um, obviously now too, with the 10 year anniversary and the 10 year mark, it's um, even as relevant as it was when you made it um, several years ago. So. Sam, can you share with us, welcome, and can you share with us a little bit more about where you were born and your life in Syria? Well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Curry, for 
for having me here and, uh, and for Shelterbox. I mean, uh, the amazing works, the amazing work you've been uh, guys doing. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's I, that we really appreciate regardless of being uh, Syrian born or, or just as, as a human being. I think what uh, the efforts that you guys put on daily basis just to, to help the needy people around the world is, is incredible. Uh, actually, uh, I was born in Aleppo. Uh, I was born and raised in uh, in Aleppo. Uh, you know, life over there is a, you know it, it, it's different. I would uh, call it maybe uh, two phases. The the first phase is when you are a kid, in uh, you know uh, no responsibilities. Uh, you're enjoying life, uh, living with the, you know beautiful people, amazing people, the most generous people, uh, incredible culture, uh, amazing food. Uh, yeah incredible you know uh, uh historical places that you could visit uh it's the oldest uh, country in the world uh you know uh, aleppo and damascus is like two of the oldest cities uh, you know on earth and uh, uh so you know it, it used to be definitely a lot of fun a very peaceful country uh, uh full of resources uh mediterranean weather uh a lot of fun now mm -hmm. phase two you realize when you are an adult that there are definitely things uh, are missing uh mm -hmm. as any uh, oppressed nation uh somehow you are an extension of the government uh, uh regardless of you know you like it or you don't like it uh you speak on their behalf uh you have to stand for what they're saying and you have to support them again, regardless if you if you are you know if you agree or disagree. And you start feeling the oppression. You start feeling that the freedom of speech doesn't exist. Uh, and you know, as a somebody like me who's a, who's a, you know in love with art and artist, I was a, a stage actor when I was in Syria when I was in college, uh, right before I left Syria. Uh, definitely, I started feeling the pressure as if somebody who wants to continue in that field even though i went actually to engineering school over there and i graduated as an engineer over there but i was uh you know i was really uh, uh you know pursuing my dream to be you know a filmmaker i started as an actor and, and a playwright uh so in general you you have that uh that feel that you have really no choice there are things over there that you have to you know to to agree and uh, and it's too scary to to go against it because it jeopardizes the entire your entire you know not just yourself but your entire family and that's sure. one of the reasons why you know I thought uh, I maybe I should I should go pursue my dream somewhere else. So you left and how long ago was that that you left Syria? Uh, I left in twenty uh, when was it uh, two thousand? I left the year two thousand. So 20 yeah. years now, and 20 you came years. to the U.S. and did you come? Did you come here to study film? Yes, actually, I was in, invited as a playwright. Uh, I came to the state with a play that I wrote, and mm -hmm. uh, and I was uh, a lead actor in that play. Uh, so I came with that uh, to you know perform it in the United States, and and but definitely I had a dream of uh, you know of of pursuing uh, a career in you know in entertainment and in particular in, in in film and that took a while until I kind of like I adjusted my mm -hmm. status in the United States back then mm -hmm. and and went to school and I studied filming and the rest is history and and you've had incredible success and I know one of your first films the citizen was critically acclaimed and then you put your life on hold and I know for several years you dedicated your life to making this film, Little Gandhi. So can you share with everyone a bit more about the story of Giyah Matar and tell us more about the, the story of his life, what he did, and why you took all this time out of your life to make this film? Well, you know, uh, actually right when I was making The Citizen uh, and uh, the the Syrian uprising, uh, you know, started the Syrian revolution, uh, started back in 2011. And uh, there was so much uh, misinformation, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, about uh, the uprising over there. A part of it is actually, I think the first image 
um, in, if I'm not mistaken, in New York Times, where it was really, really early, uh, at the first, you know, first few days of the uprising over there, and they had an image, and you know, and and actually that the the headline was an image from uh, uh, the civil war in Syria, mm -hmm. and and that definitely that struck me immediately, uh, given you know uh, uh, that title for really a, a peaceful uh, uprising uh, at that mm -hmm. time and for uh, what I thought it was a, a pure revolution by, by college kids, by little kids and by college uh, students and by, you know, educated people from, you know, all sects and all religions and, and mm -hmm. you know, and as we, you know, started witnessing what's going on on the ground, I think more and more of that misinformation started mm -hmm. coming through the internet and and the news and and uh, you know so I I started making like few short films that I you know that I threw online just you know for people to understand uh, what's going on exactly I mean these films like you know six seven minutes that uh, they're mm -hmm. actually available uh, uh, online but at the you know at the end of the day I was like I need to make a serious film a full length film to describe. Uh, uh, to to rearrange that that folder that the serial folder and you know uh, I came to real, realization uh, to you know a film needs to be made and you know definitely budget was not available so instead of making a, a drama or like a narrative what we call it narrative film about that subject uh, mm -hmm. you know the decision was to make a, a documentary film so you know and and we ended up with Little Gandhi uh, a film about Syrian peace activist. Uh, Giyat Matar, who was known uh, for his initiative of facing down uh, uh, security, you know, uh, government violence and gunfires with roses and bottles of water. Uh, he was inspired by, by Mahatma Gandhi and, and mm -hmm. he, he actually marched the streets uh, peacefully and inspired millions uh, uh, in, in Syria and around the world and the nickname of Little Gandhi was given to him by actually Washington Post uh, just because he was so young he was only 25 years old when he started this and we I, I thought his life deserved uh, to be put on the big screen. So Matar was unarmed and I, I love the image and you show it a lot in the movie he went to meet the security forces and the peaceful protests with roses and bottles of water uh, what's more peaceful than that, right? And the New York Times had a great article about you, and the headline was how Syria's first Oscar contender eluded the government. And this was not an easy film to be made. I think it's one of the most fascinating stories that I really hope that we can share. And I'm going to pull up a, a picture, and it's of the rubble. And you, in the trailer, you see this gentleman. He's one of the peace activists, and you can see the, the shelling and the bombed out buildings behind him. But can you share with us how you made this film, where you were and how you made it, and how you taught these activists to help you be filmmaker, a filmmaker? They were filmmakers with you. In this. Sure. I mean, this image, this is Motaz Murad. Uh, he's an incredible activist. Uh, 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 peace activist that uh, it started, uh, his work started actually back in 2003, not 2011 as an activist. And he was actually put in prison for two and a half years just for uh, for cleaning the streets and, 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 and uh, fighting against bribes. And, you know, I mean, just little things, right? I mean, way before actually uh, the uprising 2011. Uh, it, where you know Gias Matar was born and raised in a in a suburb of Damascus uh, called Daraya, and mm -hmm. uh, that little town was besieged by the government uh, mm -hmm. at that time when we wanted to shoot the film, and uh, there were only six thousand people left in that town. Uh, originally was uh, about three hundred fifty thousand people. So and that you know that number of people, six thousand people at that time, they could not leave the city. The government couldn't get in. It's a war zone area. The people were fighting the government, and this is where we wanted to shoot the, most of the film because this is where Gias Matar was born and raised. And his friends, like uh, you know, like Motaz and others, they still there. And I wanted to connect with them and talk to them. So the only way for us and for you know my crew is 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 to be able to make this film is to connect with these activists and uh, you know. Uh, 
get their help and seek their help. And actually, we managed to connect with uh, with few of them on the ground over there and uh, over the internet. And we gave them a crash course uh, about how you know how to shoot a film and how to light the set and and how things need to be you know uh, to be done. And you know, shared with them uh you know articles and and we talked to them over skype uh and we used our base in uh, istanbul at that time in turkey we were in turkey actually shooting some uh, some interviews with some of the activists who fled syria uh, but at the same time we used our hotel actually in istanbul as a base camp to connect with these people on the ground and we asked him to recruit more people to help him like a crew you know and and to work with them and then actually uh I decided to direct the entire actually shoot inside Syria over Skype. Uh, so we were, you know, we were working remotely from Turkey while the people on the ground they were they were shooting this and we were live with them and I was, you know, calling the shots. And we got we had like some incredible activists who put their lives on the line for us to 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 tell their stories. And that was our promise to to them is is we we're gonna deliver we're gonna deliver your voice and we're going to deliver your story and, and you have to work with us. And it was very, very difficult, uh, you know, uh, to not, you know, uh, not know that actually the activist you're talking to today, if he's going to be alive tomorrow or not, because we will be interrupted by, you know, by barrel bombs uh, and by gunfire, as we hear in the trailer. These were like, this is the, the, the life, you know, really sound of, of gunfire in the background while we were shooting. Uh, so it was, it was difficult and it took a while until we completed everything we wanted uh, uh, over there without going into a lot of details. But one of the, also the most difficult things is actually uh, realizing that there is like the footage inside Syria kind of like it's stuck. Like I thought they could upload these footage for us uh, because they're, ta they're connecting with us over the internet but then we found out that their internet speed is so so slow that it might take three years for them to upload that footage for us if we want to get everything so the activist it took about six months until one of the activists uh, volunteered to smuggle the footage for us on small thumb drives uh, that he actually had under his you know under his clothes and underground tunnels and he managed to get that these thumb drives uh, mm -hmm. outside of Daraya to the capital Damascus and then smuggle them to Lebanon and then in Lebanon put them on a hard drive and you know again get it out of Lebanon to Turkey and from there we we got the, I would say 70% of what we shot uh, what we shot there. It's unbelievable. I mean to think about you directing this from Istanbul from a hotel room. I think you told me you were at the Hilton and helping these peace activists um, interviewing them and teaching them how to make films just remotely over Skype and then. Smuggling. Yeah, and credit, credit to them. I mean, credit to them for 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 uh, sticking with the process, for for fighting through it, uh, uh, for taking the risk, and uh, and for you know for the team that worked with me as well. You know, because there was a lot of technical difficulties and a lot of things we need to you know, we needed to work on. But at the end of the day, we we were really so determined to make this story and to. Uh, to to shed light on 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 one of the brightest actually, uh, uh, you know, peaceful activists in in Syria and if it's not in the world, you know, uh, Giat Matar to put his story on the big screen and I I was very very glad that we were able to do that. So Sam, I can interview you all day long. Um, the story is fast, so fascinating. I have one more question for you and then we're gonna come back to you later. But in order to be an Oscar entry, you have to, the, the film has to be shown, right? In the country of origin. Mm -hmm. and so can you, can you talk about that? What, what, what did the Academy do for you? Well, basically that's what New York Times article is all about, is how it eluded the government, which is, we shot inside Syria without them knowing, and uh, uh, one of the requirements to, you know, uh, for when when the Academy picks the film is is actually the film needs to be screened theatrically inside the uh, the you know uh, uh, inside the country of uh, you know uh, which is inside Syria, and uh, they actually they 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 realized that that was impossible. And that was very dangerous, and uh, and so they issued an exemption for us, uh, which was very rare uh, by the board of the academy, and uh, they they understood the situation, and 
they gave us the the green light that we you know we we are in regardless if this film screened or not screened or did not screen inside uh, inside Syria, and uh, that was that was great help on their end and that uh, you know I would say I mean cement the legacy of Giyat Matar and you know uh, by keeping his story in the in the library of the academy and and. and giving that buzz for the film and for his story. And that's that's the goal. This is something we never imagined. We That was not the intention as far mm -hmm. as, like we didn't really know where f this film is gonna go. It's just, we wanted to make it. And uh, uh, we we got some help from the Academy on that, on that end. And we were really excited and grateful for that. Thank you, Sam. And for everyone participating today, check out this film, Little Gandhi. It is so terrific. We're going to come back to you later, Sam. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank um, you so much for having me. And please, everyone, stay healthy and, and safe. Uh, appreciate it, Korean. And we'll, of course. We'll talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's an absolute privilege to introduce to you my next guest, and it, he is uh, an incredible, incredible humanitarian. He is a physician, a board certified dermatologist. He is also a member of the Shelterbox USA Board of Directors. And I think uh, really what's so exciting is, is what I love about you, Dr. Jabber, is just your passion to make a difference in the world. And you have served all over the world, helping families uh, who have lost everything in conflict situations. And Syria is no exception. You worked on the front lines in Jordan. And I know you've worked with the Rohingyas in Bangladesh. You worked in Nepal. And you continue, continue to serve. Um, and so I want to thank you for coming here today. Um, you have done so much. You do a lot of clinical research. You are also a teacher at Mount Sinai, helping younger dermatologists. And your true passion, I think, lies in, in helping others and serving the world. So I know um, I first met you in really many years ago. You wrote an article that appeared in the Washington Post. And it, it was all about what a doctor could do to help in a Syrian refugee camp. And you wrote the story of working in Jordan. And you've worked in small camps. You've also worked in the largest camp, Al Zatari. And you wrote an article. And I was so fascinated by you and your colleague. There's Dr. Vandau. I, um, you guys are terrific. And I know you've done so much. But you drop everything. You leave this busy medical practice behind in Manhattan and you travel to the front lines of some of the world's biggest crisis and conflict zones. What <clears throat> motivates you to do this work, Dr. Jabber? Welcome, and, and what, what's driving you to do this? First of all, thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be on this panel and to speak to everybody. You know, I think living in America, we are all so fortunate. And I, I think we, a lot of times, we forget how lucky we are and all the things that we have. And um, if I have the opportunity to give and do a little and help, I'm always happy to do that. I think in this situation, it was kind of funny. I, I, this is back in, I don't know, 2004 or three. I don't remember when I first went. I was watching the news like so many people and saw what was going on. And then one day I just came home from work. I got a random email from a friend of a friend. And it said they needed doctors to volunteer in Syrian refugee camps in Jordan. I never thought that dermatology would be that useful, to be frank. I was like, they don't need dermatologists, they need surgeons, they need burn trauma surgeons, other things. And but I said, you know what, I'm gonna email. I emailed emailed, I talked to the doctor, and he said, actually, dermatology is super needed. And so I said, Oh, this sounds pretty good. And then I called my friend Grace, who you showed a picture of, and then I asked her, and then the next thing you know, we were going uh, sometime later on. So I I feel like life is funny and things things are random and just happen and just got to take the, make the best of it. So thank you, Dr. Jabber. Um, I, I'm hoping to, to take people into El Zatari. And this is a refugee camp in Jordan. It's, it was home to 100,000 Syrian refugees. Tell us about what you what life is like in the camp. Tell us about, help us paint the picture of what you saw and what you experienced in these camp settings. Well, I think you should think about what as Sam just said, I mean, these, in the picture that you showed earlier in that in that beautiful video of uh, the movie, you know, these are people that are just basically leaving their country because they're scared of dying. And so in those situations, you're really just leaving with the clothing on your back. That's so many of the people that we met, they basically thought, well, if I don't leave today, I'm going to die tomorrow. And they would walk 
I mean, they would walk hundreds and hundreds of miles, which is basically the clothes on their back, and ended up in this situation, this Camp Zothery is basically in the middle of the desert, as you can see here. And mm -hmm. they had over a hundred, at one point it was over a hundred thousand people in two square miles. So you can imagine how tight and congested it was. And they just kind of built this camp. People have really what they, they really don't have anything. They have their clothes on their back and then they really rely on the generosity of, of the international community and organizations like Shelterbox that can give them things like shelter and help them get food and water and all those things because they don't have anything with them. Um, you know, the people there, the, the work opportunities are very limited. So that was the thing that I think struck me the most is, you know, Syria was a functioning country prior to this. And so when you, when in meeting the patients that we met, you meet people that were mm -hmm. uh, engineers, business people, uh, teachers, uh, dentists, and now they are just sitting in these camps and they can't really do anything. And they're kind of stuck there. And I think that to me was, that's really the thing that really stuck with me is that these are people that had normal lives and now are just stuck and they really can't do anything for no fault of their own. And they're really entirely reliant on the generosity of international donors for everything. Mm -hmm. And it's often we hear that, you know, it's it's a generation, right, that they'll spend in the camps. I think the average now is about 17 years. So these camps truly become like cities. And you and I were talking about how you would show up to really do your work and there'd be hundreds of people waiting to see you. So, and a lot of people that help you, uh, that are there to help you and facilitate your interactions and, and being able to see patients. Can you share some stories? Can you tell us maybe who sticks with you from your, these humanitarian mission trips that you, that you don't forget about? Yeah, no, I, like you said, I think, you know, people when they hear that there's going to be doctors coming from America, they wait in line for hours to see us. And um, the thing that I think, the couple of things really striking, I think these pictures show it over, and you mentioned it earlier, so many of these people are, are, are young kids. So over 50% of the refugees are children uh, under the age of 18. And you see that in the camps. In the camps, you really see, or even all among all the refugees, they're, they're usually children and women. You, see, you don't see many men. Um, mm -hmm. or probably a lot of them, I'm guessing, were still in Syria because of war or they're in prison. But it's really women and children that are affected by this. Mm -hmm. um, as for you know, patients, I saw so many patients, and I, I, I think universally, I think that, again, what struck me the most was when one of the days we were, had all these people waiting in line to see us, and we had this young woman that was facilitating, trying to keep order and peace, and as I started talking to her, I found out she was a dentist, and she was a practicing dentist back in Syria and had a successful practice, probably just as educated as I was, and now she can't work. She's stuck there, and her job was to facilitate the line for us to help us. And I think that struck with me. I mean, you the conditions that we saw are typical things that you'd see in a normal day-to-day -day as a dermatology office, but a lot of them are also related to the situation where people are living in. As I said, these camps are, Jordan's a very dry place. Um, it's the, the refugee camps themselves are in the desert and patients there that live there don't really have access to the things that we take for granted. Um, about, moisturizers, soap, cleansers, unless they're given, given that to them, they don't have those things. And so they're living in very congested environments. So things like scabies, bed bugs, all those, all those things that occur are really much more common. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Dr. Jabber. Um, we're gonna come back to you later for some questions to you, but I really appreciate all the ways that you serve and so many ways and all the work you do to help Shelterbox and all the work that you do to help all of the refugees in the world on your mission trips. So thank you for being with us today. Keep up the great work. And we'll, thank you. So I am going to move now um, into more of the humanitarian needs of these families that have been displaced, um, both internally displaced families as well as refugees. I would love to introduce to you my colleague, uh, Sanj Shurkanthan. He is the CEO of Shelterbox. And prior to Shelterbox, he spent many, many years working as the executive director of the International Rescue Committee and in Europe. And he has been a captain 
in the British Army. He has served in the Middle East. He has spent time working in Syria. I think, Sanj, the London Standard said you are one of the London's key change makers, and you do so much to really help families around the world. Um, and so thank you for your leadership at Shelterbox, and thanks for being here today. Um, Sanj, I want to start, I know that you worked in Syria at the beginning of the conflict, and 10 years ago when you were working in Syria, would you ever have expected that 10 years later we would be in one of the worst humanitarian crisis situations of our whole generation, and we'd still be responding? Um, as you know, this is the longest, this is the biggest response in Shelterbox's history. Would you ever think that we would still be working in this country? Well, firstly, thank you for having me, Kerry, and it's great to be part of this great panel on, on such an important topic. And to answer your question, I don't think any of us foresaw 10 years later that we'd still be here talking about this terrible conflict without an end in sight. I think uh, in that first winter, our hope was to bring as much aid as possible, as quickly as possible, to get people through the winter and, and hope for a political solution so that families could return to their proper homes and and of course that hasn't happened and for all the winters since we've done our best to provide what is effectively a band-aid solution to what is a much bigger crisis that is in deadlock mm -hmm. so sanj this has been some of the most challenging work i know that we do our typical model is boots on the ground um, but we've had to take a very different strategic approach so can you can you share kind of the overall strategy of uh, the deployments that we have across the past 10 years and, and maybe how those how those have evolved and changed over time well, I'm incredibly proud to be part of an organization that has stuck with this response. It is our largest uh, humanitarian response in our history, uh, and it is warranted given the scale of the need. You know, 12.3 million people displaced, over half that number within the country. Um, and our response when it began was actually to help support the tens of thousands, then became hundreds of thousands, and of course millions who left the country for Lebanon, Turkey, Iraq, almost anywhere uh, they could get to that was safer than the conflict in its early years. And so we were distributing shelter items in the Bekaa Valley in, in Lebanon or in the camps just inside Turkey and also in Iraq. And this was about trying to support families who'd left with literally the clothes on their back and whatever they could carry uh, and had left everything behind. And of course, as uh, Dr. Samer said, this is a, a, a country that was um, supporting itself, had a large middle class, um, functioning hospitals and a society. And so um, imagine if, if it were you and leaving, what would you need? And so we tried to think about that in our response. Um, since then, we've evolved our work to now be working with partners inside Syria, which is high risk uh, and volatile because there are no front lines in this conflict. There are uh, shifting front lines and many parties of the conflict. It's not just rebels in government. Um, and so uh, we have to do our best because uh, not only are the needs still there in all these neighboring countries, but for the 6.4 million people displaced within the country, and sometimes it's more, sometimes it can be less, they're not just displaced once, but many times. And in the winter, uh, people may not know this, but the winter in Syria can be as harsh as the winter in the United States or in, in many European countries. And so uh, not having a home it can be life threatening. And so the shelter we provide, the kits we provide in the boxes uh, behind you and me uh, are saving lives. And particularly for young children, we've adapted the kit to ensure we're providing these sort of winter onesies that are so important to preserving body heat in children, uh, as well as um, of course, more recently, and particularly last year, of course, PPE, and that includes soap and hand basins, but also masks and gloves, and doing distributions in the safest possible way, because humanitarians have to ensure we're doing no harm, which is not spreading COVID by doing distributions badly. So um, mm -hmm. it's another challenge, but we've been doing this now for so long, tragically, but it does mean we're good at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, there, there's so much to, to unpack there, Sanj, so thank you. Um, but I, I think what I heard from you as well as from 
really from Samer is that so many, and from Sam, is that so many of these Syrians are risking their lives. They're now filmmakers, they're aid workers, they're distributing aid on behalf of our organization and risking their lives to do it. Many of them have stayed behind. Um, 6.7 million people continue to be internally displaced within Syria, and 80% of the Syrian population in poverty. And so it's really, really basic need provision. It's food, it's water, it's shelter, very basic things. You mentioned COVID, and as an organization, we had to make a huge, huge pivot last year. And for so many of the families we serve, which are some of the most vulnerable in the world, you know, there's little chance for a hospital bed if they get sick with COVID. And so we made a lot of different adaptations. So um, can, can you talk a little bit more about that? And I wanna, I'm gonna share some of those photos as well, because I, I think it's really important that, you know, we, we really were able to make some pivots and I, I think we probably will continue to make some meaningful ones as well yeah. as we move forward with this crisis. Yeah, well, firstly, uh, to survive COVID, you've got to do the same things we're doing, which is to isolate and prevent onward transmission. And um, for anyone who's worked in uh, an IDP camp, an internally displaced persons camp or a refugee camp, uh, they are very crowded. And uh, often there's a lack of privacy. Uh, sometimes there are collective shelters uh, where there's very little to no privacy. And those are all life-threatening as well as a loss of dignity for people who are incredibly proud. And so um, the shelter we provide allows families to isolate safely. And we realized quickly as the first crisis mounted in, in March and, and the virus was spreading, that we have a role to play in preventing the onward transmission while we wait for the scientists to develop the vaccine. Um, obviously hands, washing hands is the other part. So we added that to the kit and then face masks to prevent people breathing on one another. And our kits uh, by and large are designed to help a family isolate. That wasn't the intent, of course, it was to give them dignity and the, and the shelter they need, but actually it was an effective tool to put families in, in their own units. Uh, and so we got as many out as possible, as early as possible with the items that they needed. Uh, and I think that in part helped to disrupt the transmission, combined with doing distributions over more days, so with fewer people every day, so we could create spacings when we were distributing. And every day of distribution is a risk. Um, there could be an attack, uh, mm -hmm. there could be a bombing, uh, families could be forced to move. So it was a risk, but it was one worth taking so that we were preventing COVID being transmitted. Of course, all of this is not the final solution. We have got to address the fact that vaccine rollout in Syria is much lower than many parts of the world. And leading countries where vaccine rollout is going so well, including the US and UK, do need to think about um, vaccine uh, philanthropy and ensuring that we are getting spare doses to the most vulnerable parts. And Syria certainly counts as one of those. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sanj. Um, I think that this work continues. Um, as I mentioned, it's the longest piece of our work, it's the biggest piece of our work, is helping in the Syrian crisis. And um, it's a privilege to work alongside you and all the volunteers and all the partners that make this work possible. It's truly life-saving for these families. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that there are several shelter box supporters on the line today that truly enable our work in Syria and our work around the world. And I wanna say a big thank you because it's the private charitable support and the ways that all of you lean in that make all of this work possible. And we would never have been able to serve 400,000 people in Syria over the last decade without you. So we are grateful for you. Uh, I'm gonna start now and I have a very brief Q and A with our three incredible panelists. And we are gonna round out today with an incredible musician who has written the original score for Little Gandhi. And I'm really excited to, to, to introduce him in just a moment. But before we get there, I'm gonna turn the cameras on for our panelists so we can ask each of you a question. Um, Sanj, I see you, so I'm gonna start with you quickly. Um, just the strategy. What's our strategy as we go forward? Where, where do we go from here in, in Syria? It's a really great question. Uh, firstly, we have to deal with the emergency in front of us, which is COVID, uh, and ensuring that families are, are not without shelter because they have the triple effect of uh, the, um, the COVID emergency, the conflict, 
uh, as well as um, conditions in the country, which, which I'll come on to. Um, and so we need to keep doing what we're doing. Uh, we have to get ready for the next winter because they are cold and young children, women are particularly vulnerable and make sure our, our shelter kits, which we constantly adapt, are tailored to their needs. We also need to think about new challenges that the country is facing. The Syrian pound has devalued. Uh, oil is running low, which means it's affected agricultural production as well. So cash and food are things that are in short supply. And whilst we are focused around shelter, we are exploring how we can work with others to meet the most pressing needs of Syrians as they tell them to us. Um, and so that's the forward looking part of this strategy that we need to think about is in addition to shelter, how can we support families through a really grim time uh, whilst also advocating strongly for a peaceful solution in Syria so that um, we don't have to stay for another 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Sanj. Um, Sam, we have a question for you uh, about Little Gandhi and uh, Jihad Matar. And if you could talk to him today and you could tell him something, what would you say to him today? Well, I would immediately apologize for him and, and, and feel ashamed that we were not able uh, to make his dream come true yet. It's a decade and more than 13 million displaced Syrians uh, right now and, and over half a million people paid their lives you know, during this, this conflict uh, that started actually just by people demanding, like Giyas Matar, demanding freedom and dignity. Uh, uh, it, it's just, I feel, I feel really ashamed I, I, uh, on behalf of humanity. Uh, uh, but what I promise Giyas that we will continue to deliver his voice. We will continue to, to be vocal about the cause that he, he fought for and he paid his life you know, for. And, uh, you know, uh, we have to rely on the power of people and what we promise Liaz to do that uh, and the power of people like you and, and Sanj and, and Dr. Jabber and everybody else uh, to put pressure actually on, on our politicians to and the rest of the world to do something mm -hmm. and to end the, you know, the biggest crisis, uh, humanitarian crisis since World War II. And, you know, to actually, hopefully, uh, make Syria better for Giyas's son, who's right now, mm -hmm. you know, almost now, like, you know, 12 years old. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, it's, it's really a very emotional subject, you know, when it comes to, to, you know, the pioneers like Giyas and what they, what they, the dream that they had. And mm -hmm. how you know, and and what would we what we did for them? Uh, so I hope we all mobilize at the same time to you know to end this this crisis. And I appreciate Sanj and Kerry your work and Samer and everybody else uh, to support the Syrians and mm -hmm. uh, and to stand uh, up for them. So appreciate. Well, it. Sam, you should never feel ashamed because you are an incredible human rights activist and you've given such a voice, a powerful voice in your films. So. And I hope you continue to do that. Um, so Dr. Jabber, um, just tapping onto Sam's question too, um, it's 10 years later and has fallen off the headlines. It just has. And I wish I had people ringing me up every day that said, how can I help support your work in Syria? It's hard, it's a hustle. And, um, but you care. And I know there are others like you. So how do we make sure that the people in Syria aren't forgotten? And why should they continue to, why should people continue to care about this? You know, I think it's hard. I think you're right. I think people have a lot of fatigue. It's been going on for 10 years and I, you know, we're just, everyone, people get tired. But the situation isn't much better. You know, it's been 10 years later and it's not much better. And there, I think you just have to remember that so many of these people are just, they're normal people that had normal lives. And now they're stuck in these places where they really have no opportunities. They're relying on donations from wonderful organizations like Shelterbox. Without them, they'll starve, freeze to death. They don't have access to food, shelter, or anything. And I think 
we're all human and um, we should all help each other. And I, I think that's the lesson of coronavirus this year. You know, life is hard, and but we're still so fortunate to be again in America. I mean, this is a terrible year for all of us, but being in America, we are so lucky. And I think if we can help others, we should have, we should really try to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jabber. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sanj. Uh, I know that a lot of people have asked questions about how they can get involved. And yes, we do need financial support for this work. It is the only thing that enables our work in Syria. You can learn more at shelterboxusa.org and you can contribute to our work in Syria or any of our other global humanitarian emergency shelter projects. We are gonna close out today with someone who's really special, who I had the privilege of meeting through Sam Cotty uh, when we were showing the film down at the Charlie Chaplin Cinema uh, down in Los Angeles. And his name is Dylan Connor. And Dylan's wife, Reem, is from Syria. They are both activists. They lead missions and, and it was a, a little, about a year ago, right before the crisis started the pandemic that Dylan rang me up and said, we're headed to Turkey, we're gonna do a mission, will you come? And I said, well, when are you leaving? He said, tomorrow. So you get these, <laughs> you get these Facebook messages from people saying we're going. And, and I think you collect a lot of interesting friends in this line of work and people that are driven to make a difference. And Dylan is one of those gentlemen. But he is a Latin teacher in Connecticut. He's a musician and he wrote the film score for Little Gandhi called Man of Peace. So we're gonna close out today with Dylan's song. Thank you, Dylan, for being here and contributing your beautiful music. And I wanna say a big thank you to all of you for participating in today's webinar. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Big special thank you to Kerry Murray for inviting me to this important event marking the 10th anniversary of the Syrian revolution, the uprising for freedom, dignity, self-determination, justice, democracy that filled the streets of the cities in Syria in 2011. In the decades since, there has been unspeakable tragedy and horror. But in the face of that, there are good people and good organizations such as Shelterbox providing basic necessities of shelter to those Syrians in their most desperate hour. So thank you, Shelterbox, for all you do. I'd like to give a special shout out to Sam Cotty. Sam invited me to contribute a song to his amazing film, Little Gandhi. The song I wrote inspired by that film is called Man of Peace. And I'm going to sing that for you today. So let us hold in our hearts and in our thoughts and prayers all of those Syrians with peaceful intentions who took to the streets, broke the wall of fear that had been in that country for so long due to the oppressive government, and demanded their most basic human rights. You are not forgotten. You give us hope. Did not die in vain. Ria, 
us, free us, we will carry your flame, free us, we won't stop until the lion's in chains, and the stars above are forever singing your name. more dangerous than rage they stole you away and locked you up in a cage the way they killed you was vile and depraved and their crimes will follow them beyond the grave The man of peace Who opened the door The man of peace Who was still marching for The man of peace Whose heart was so pure We were lost on the ocean Yet brought us to shore The man Dylan Connor, thank you so much for being here. And I wanna thank everyone for being here. Um, I couldn't think of a better way to end than with an incredible artist. Uh, as you heard, Syria has been, is filled with incredible artists, now incredible activists, humanitarians. I wanna thank you uh, for participating today and a big thank you to our panelists. Sam, Samer, Sanj, thank you so much for being here. I love the line in that song, Dylan, where you said, the man of peace, your compassion was more dangerous than rage. And all of you have shown nothing but compassion for the Syrian people. And this work continues. And I wanna say a big thank you to everyone. If you wanna learn more about how you can support Shelterbox and our work in Syria, you can go to shelterboxusa.org. And thank you so much for participating today. We'll continue to keep you updated on this important work. Thank you so much. <laughs>